I am a man of action. I am an activist at heart. Uh, I thrive on accomplishment. Uh, my family thinks I kind of like have ants in my pants. I'll be sitting at home and I'll see something or think of something that needs to be done and I'm up. Uh, every day I have a big list of things I want to get done and as the day goes by and I'm not getting them all done, I go faster and faster. I think we all live under the illusion that we can carry on with ever-increasing speed and at the same time our soul will go with us no matter what speed we've attained. I find that when I'm always moving fast, I can lose connection with God. Uh, I just ask God to help me, you know, keep my speed up. I say, God, you're going to have to go real fast with this to stay up with me today, but stay close. To stay connected with God and to grow with Christ, we have to stop the rat race at least sometime each day, slow things way down, and spend some time with Christ. Usually it's time in prayer and in, 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 in looking at the Bible. This is the third in a series of messages called Standing Firm in Hard Times. We all face uh, hard times at some time or another, like Mark was talking about in, in his prayer. In 60 AD, the Apostle Peter wrote a letter to Christians in the Roman province of Asia. It would be what we call uh, Eastern Turkey today. Uh, they were facing persecution under the rule of uh, Emperor Nero in Rome. How could they stand firm in their face in the face of all the pressure they were facing? How could they grow strong in Christ so they would not give up on God when all the persecution came at them? I know so many people who have given up on God because they lost a child or lost a mate or lost a parent at a you know, young age uh, or got an a, you know, a, a ominous uh, medical diagnosis. They say, why would God do that? I want nothing to do with him. How can we grow strong in Christ so we don't throw in the towel on our faith when difficult times come? Peter tells them and us today, God's word helps us grow up in Christ. Uh, study after study has shown that the number one discipline that will help you grow in Christ is spending time each day with God in his word, reflecting on it. Why does God's word help us grow up in Christ? How does God's word help us grow up in Christ? Peter suggests six ways in 1 Peter 1, 22 to chapter 2, verse 8. First, he says, God's word is like seed. Verse 23, for you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable. Uh, in the parable of the sower, in Luke 8, 11, Jesus says, the seed is the word of God. Once we understand that God's word is like seed, it gives us a better picture of what it does in our lives. Whenever we hear God's word or we read it, reflect on it, it's like seed being planted in our minds. And it'll reap a harvest. It, it may not come immediately. A farmer never plants seed and expects to harvest the next day. But it will reap a harvest. Uh, when I was a, a young boy, our family would... Uh, uh, have a little jar at the center of the table and inside of it were memory verses and often after dinner we would take a memory verse and just kind of memorize it together. I probably by the time I hit high school I probably knew 300 verses and then when I got into college and into graduate school it kind of I got convicted that memorizing was very important and uh, I, I memorized many more verses so probably you know I got up to 1500 or more verses and as those verses have come to my mind through the years when I'm in a moment of need. They've come to me. There's been a harvest. Parents, this is why it's so important that you read to your kids, your infants, your toddlers, your uh, grade schoolers, uh, your, your teenagers, uh, and uh, memorize verses with them. You know, we have a memory verse. If you're looking for a memory verse, uh, we have a memory verse each week in the journal, and they're all what I call classic verses, uh, kind of famous verses. God's Word helps us grow up in Christ. A second way God's Word helps us grow up in Christ is God's Word is living. Verse 23 again, but of imperishable seed through the living and enduring Word of God. 
Uh, Peter says it's living. In chapter 2, verse 4, he says, as you come to him, Jesus Christ, the living stone. Uh, stones are anything but living, but he says Jesus is the living stone because he's been resurrected from the dead. He's alive. The Bible is not some ancient book, lifeless words on a page. It's living. When we read it and study it, it brings life to us. A third way God's Word helps us grow up in Christ is God's Word is enduring. Verse 23, through the living and enduring Word of God. Then Peter quotes from Isaiah 40, For all People are like grass, and all their glory is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Grass withers, flowers fall, but God's word endures forever. It's always true. It's true today. It'll be true 25 years from now. This is why it's so important we spend some time reflecting on God's word. Use our journals. You know, when I started this church, uh, I had a dream, uh, a vision that we would have a journal like this, and I'm so thankful for the people that put these together, and uh, we could all be studying the same thing. You, we, ha- we hear one thing in a sermon, you're studying it individually during the week, then maybe it's, it's talked about in a community group, maybe in the youth group, all things. And uh, uh, studies show that when... Uh, if you study a number of different things during the week, let's say you're reading something personally and then the sermon's about something else, your community group's about still something else, uh, you have a less chance of applying anything because you're getting multiple messages. So that was the idea. But I just want to add, uh, though I you know, am promoting this every week, I, I recognize that there are other things. Some of you are in community Bible study. That's fine. Yeah, that's what maybe you're doing. And uh, the youth this year are trying uh, something new where they're going to go through the whole Bible. That's fine, too. I, uh, so the point is that you spend time in God's Word. But anyway, people do send me photos of uh, when they're uh, using the journal. So I got this one from Chuck Hayward. Um, the thing I like about this one, he's wearing his work gloves. So, you know, when he goes to read the Bible, he sees it as work. And, uh, and then there's, uh, here's one of some of the kids in the youth group uh, uh, reading the, the journal, and uh, then there's uh, the, the Rich's uh, grandkids. I think they're uh, reading a journal. Then, uh, uh, then there's Avery Quinn, uh, uh, Chris and Lindsay Quinn. She's in her you know, crib. She's already getting started. So, Another way we can grow up in Christ in God's Word is through community groups. Uh, how could, do you ever wonder how 120 disciples in the upper room could take care of 3,000 new converts? Peter preached and 3,000 people became believers in one day. Well, we know some of those people left town, went back to Bithynia, Cappadocia, you know, Pontus, some of these cities where Peter's writing to, they left, but a lot of them stayed in Jerusalem. How did they do it? They did it through small groups. Uh, In Acts 2.46, we read, they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Paul's writing to Philemon. He says, also to Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. In Romans 16, he says, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers. They risked their lives for me. Not only I, but all of the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. Greet also the church that meets at their house. That's how they did it. We have 11 community groups here. Why don't you come on up here, Chuck? Uh, Would you pull out your program for a minute, folks? Uh, And uh, inside, there's a little yellow sheet. So here are the 11 uh, community groups that we have, and I'll just kind of read through these real quick. We have one on Monday for college and young singles. Uh, We have one on Monday uh, twice a month for uh, up at Skyline area, open to everyone. Uh, We have a Tuesday women's Bible study. Tuesday evening meets here. Thursday morning, women's Bible study meets here. Another women's Bible study meets uh, at Edgewood. Uh, Then on the back of the page, Thursday, uh, once a month, we have Sam and Amy Miller have one that uh, meets uh, at their home. Uh, We have the Rich Wines have one mostly for empty nesters uh, at their home. Uh, Saturday, men's morning watch uh, meets here. Sunday, we, uh, Ch- Chuck, here, here comes your group, uh, for parents of youth. And then Sunday, twice a month, uh, Derek Bentley and Julie Yang have one for singles. And then uh, there's one uh, 
in uh, Bethany area at the Kincaids. Uh, that's my son and his wife. And John and Rhea Meyer lead one uh, for mostly families with young children. So tell us about your group. What, what's your group doing? Sure. Uh, my name is Chuck Hayward. My wife is Kristen. Uh, you'll notice she's not here today because uh, we have two very active children. Uh, one of them, this, I got a picture here, I think. You got a picture? Maybe not. Anyway, I got, I got two very active kids. And uh, so this is about 15 minutes old, that photograph. So that's where he is right now. He's playing water polo. Um, my wife and I were, um, we've been listening to Ron for a while, and, and we've had experience with, with groups before. And I can tell you what Ron is teaching right now about the, the gather, grow, and serve. You need to gather, you need to grow, and you need to serve together. That's how you're going to learn and, and grow in Christ. And these, these community groups are a big part of that. Uh, Chris and I made a board in the back that shows where the community groups are. So you should go check that out. Find a group that works for you. Right there. Um, it's not hung up yet, but we'll get it hung up. Uh, when Kristen was making the board, we, we forgot which one was which. She added connect, and I'm adding that to your sermon series, connect. Because it's more than just gathering, and it's more than, in order to grow, you have to connect. And in order to connect, you have to have people that you can relate with. The community group that we set up is based on... First of all, our need to, because we couldn't, we couldn't fit in the time because of our active children. We couldn't fit any of the times that would work. We had to be here every day or every Sunday for, to help with the, uh, to drop our kids off. And then we had about an hour in between. We said, well, what a perfect opportunity. And there's a group of people that we can relate to. Now that doesn't mean that our whole group is just gonna be people who have people in the youth group. We're inviting anybody. If, you, if you've had kids, if your kids are, if you're empty nesters, I don't wanna steal from the empty nest group, but. but uh, if you've had kids before, if you're thinking about having kids and you want to be put off on the idea, we can help you with that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that's what we're doing. And we help out every, so we're going to meet every other week. We meet here at five. We help the kids. They have a meal. We help prepare the meals. We clean up afterwards while they go play games. And then we sit down and have our Bible study. We're already here. The family's already here. And what's the point of going home and coming right back? So that's where we're sending it up. But you, you don't have to have a kid in the youth group. If you want to come and join us, We'd love to have you. We're trying to commit, create community. That's what it's about. So. All right. Great. Okay. Thanks. Another way we can grow up in Christ is through uh, family Bible reflection time. Uh, Moses says, these commandments I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Uh, the family is God's primary vehicle for winning children to Christ, reaching the world, and passing faith to the next generation. Um, when we were in Michigan this summer, our family tried to uh, sit down every day and uh, do the journal. We would do two or three questions. Uh, we probably averaged more like did it every two days, and uh, Cam would lead it. She goes to University of Montana, and uh, so we'd, we'd do, uh, you know, a few questions. Then we would uh, pray. Jory and I would be one prayer group, and then Cam, Jamie, and Erica would be the other prayer group, share prayer requests, and, and we were on our way. Uh, one key to that is it get, it's got to be short. I, I don't think it took us more than 10 minutes. And... Uh, uh, and uh, that just just such an important uh, thing to do uh, to to help uh, you know your family grow. Most uh, Christian families are like Flintstone families. Remember the Flintstones? They had an open floorboard in their car, and they would get around town using their feet to to propel their car. I mean, you could get around town that way in your car without an engine, but uh, uh, you'd be exhausted. Uh, most Christian families are trying. Uh, to be a Christian family without the engine, family, Bible, reflection, and prayer. Uh, and, you know, maybe you only do this once a week. Maybe you try to do it every day, but something with your family is just so important. Still, fourth way God's Word helps us grow up in Christ is God's Word is like milk. Chapter 2, verse 2, like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Uh, God's Word is like milk. It helps us grow. It sustains those who feed on it. As most of you know, Jory and I have nine children. Four are biological and five are adopted. Uh, but the pattern of drinking milk has been a, the same with all nine of them. We put them down for a nap. Uh, then they stir. Then they cry. And if we still don't do anything, they cry more forcefully. Then we go pick them up, probably change them. 
and then they're going to get some milk. Once, once they realize that's what's coming next, they start to pant. <laughs> they crave milk. And Peter says, like babies, crave the pure spiritual milk of God's Word. Do you? Do you look forward to slowing things down and stopping and spending some time with Christ and in the Bible and in prayer? That's what you need to stand firm in hard times. Still, a fifth way God's Word helps us grow up in Christ is God's Word is truth. Verse 22, now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth. God's Word is truth. In the second Peter, chapter 1, verse 20, Peter says, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. He says, no one wrote any line of Scripture by just kind of their own idea. This is my idea about how life works. He says, they were all inspired by God by the Holy Spirit, and they wrote. And God saw to it that they all wrote in such a way <clears throat> that they told the truth and didn't make errors. Uh, officials in the government that uh, look for counterfeit money are trained by first putting them in a room with real money. So they're put in there with $1 bills, five, tens, 20s, 50s, 100s, you know thousand dollar bills and they just study it they look at it they touch it they feel it they lick it whatever it takes then they're put in a room with counterfeit money and they look at it and they said this is counterfeit they say how do you know that I don't know for sure but I just know why because they've been studying the real thing it's the same with God's word if you study God's Word, if you memorize it, you get to know it, then when you come upon something that's not right, you know this is not, there's something off about this. Kids, this is why it's so important that you study God's Word when you're young and, and get to know it and memorize some verses. Then when you get to you know, high school and college and your professors chipping away at your faith and saying stuff, you know, and you, you just, you know, this is not right. This is off. This is what happened to Nabil Karishi in his uh, book, Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. Uh, he grew up in a strong Muslim home, and his parents were very active in instructing their children. And he was instructed from a little boy all the way up, as all Muslims are, that the uh, Quran is perfectly preserved. All Muslims are taught that the, the, the Quran has never changed. What you have here is exactly what Muhammad received directly from Gabriel. Well, then he got to college and he met a guy named David, who was as strong a Christian as he was a Muslim. And they, they established a friendship. And they would talk about their faith and they would argue. And uh, they would challenge each other. And so uh, Nabil found himself having to go and study uh, the Quran and, and his Islam faith. Uh, and uh, he, he found out that Muhammad had dictated the Quran. He would dictate to some people with him, and then he might be with somebody else, and he'd dictate, you know, just a, a few lines. And then with somebody else, he might dictate it and be in a little different style. So while he was living, arguments uh, uh, came up between his followers. He said, wait, no, he said this, no, he said this, and they were arguing about it. After his death, the task was given to a man named Zaid ibn Tabit to collect the Quran into one document. He found it difficult to do because he found certain uh, uh, sections where one or verse where he could only find one person that could say, this is what Muhammad said. Eventually, when he got done, he gave it to one of Muhammad's widows uh, to safeguard. Once it came out, what Zaid had done, uh, they found that he'd left certain portions of the Quran out. And uh, so they had some uh, uh, Muslims in, in some regions uh, reciting this and others reciting this, and you know, it was incongruous. So then a man named Khalifa Uthman <coughs> ordered the Quran to be standardized. 
So they took back the, the copy that the widow had been safeguarding. They edited it and then distributed it out widely. Uh, it left out. Some sections, uh, Ube Kibben Cobb used to recite. He insisted he would not stop reciting it because he had heard it directly from Muhammad. Um, what ultimately pushed Nabil over the edge is when he learned uh, that upon his death, Muhammad selected four people that he thought were the best teachers of the Quran. And uh, this is in a hadith from Sahih Bukhari. He learned that none of the four of them agreed on the content of the Quran. Uh, uh, let's see, uh, Ube had 116 chapters, Zaid had 114, Ibn Masud had 111 chapters, and there were many grammatical errors throughout the whole thing. Now Bill added it all up. You got missing chapters, missing verses, variant readings, grammatical errors throughout, and the, what he had been taught since he was a boy crumbled right in front of him. And then as he met with his friend David, and David talked about the Bible, he learned and he began to study the Bible that it wasn't just one author like Muhammad, but many authors, and they wrote it over a 1,500-year period. Even though they'd done it over that many years, it only had one message. All the Old Testament pointed to Jesus' de uh, birth, life, death, and resurrection, and all the New Testament pointed back to Jesus. And it's the best authenticated work of ancient history in the world. It's the truth. And it was at that point, Nabil became a Christian. There's still one more way God's word helps us grow up in Christ, and that's God's word is the cornerstone of life. Uh, Jesus is called the word many times in the Bible. He's the word of God come in the flesh. The Bible is God's word in written form. Uh, Peter tells us Jesus is the cornerstone of our faith. So the Bible is the cornerstone of our faith. Chapter 2, verse 4, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but uh, to him also, like living stones, you are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be uh, put to shame. Uh, so the cornerstone in, in the temple was the stone that set the direction for all the other stones in the temple. And Peter says Jesus is the cornerstone. He's the one that sets the direction for your living. And the Bible is the cornerstone that gives you direction for, for your living. God's word helps us grow up in Christ. Do you want to be stronger in Christ this year so you can stand firm in your faith when, when you hit hard times? Then I urge you, if you're not already doing this, to slow it down at least one time during every day and set aside a little bit of time. I, I say 15 minutes. People are often surprised that uh, I suggest such a short time, but I want it to be manageable, uh, sustainable. Uh, and you spend some time in, in prayer, you, you praise God, you kind of start by uh, praising God, then you say, God, help me focus. I'm just going to do this for 15 minutes, help me focus on what I read, and, and uh, maybe I'll do, you know, two or three questions in the journal. Help me, uh, give me something for this day. And then you close by praying, praying through your day, praying for the, the people, you know, most important people in your life, and, and, and off you go. Uh, you know, whether you're a grade schooler, teenager, you're not too young to do this. In fact, if you haven't learned this before you go off to college, you're going to be, it's going to be tough to ever pick up the practice. Um, young single, uh, newlywed, newlyweds, you can hold each other accountable to grow uh, in your faith. Uh, parent, you need this so that you can be a good parent. You need some time with Christ. Empty nester, you may have the best shot at this of anybody here. It's a little less complicated maybe in your life. Grandparent, you need this. You need to be able to have something for your grandchildren. Unbeliever, you say, I don't believe the Bible. I don't know what I believe about Christ. Maybe you've never read the Bible as an adult. You've thought negative things about the Bible, but you've never looked at it yourself firsthand. This would be a great thing to do. Join a community group that will hold you accountable. 
God's word holds, uh, helps us grow up in Christ. Now, I know you've heard this before. I, I say something like this multiple times every year, that you have to spend some time in God's word, reflecting on it, to grow up in Christ. And you say, yeah, yeah, I've heard that before. But this year, I hope you, if you haven't before, you would take me seriously and say, okay, I'm going to shoot for this a few minutes every day. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Peter's words, writing to people that were facing all kind of pressure to give up their faith. And uh, you uh, um, told them that one of the best ways is to spend some time in God's word and to, to grow up in Christ in that. So I want to give you a minute just to uh, talk to God. Uh, maybe you'd say, okay, God, I've heard this before, but ah, I struggle to, to make time to read a little in the Bible and pray, and I, I want to take it seriously this year and do that. Why don't you make that commitment? You just pray silently right now. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for speaking to us through uh, the Apostle Peter. In Jesus' name we pray.